Wujuri Warami Walambi, Jigura Nangala Marinura Bulbul Iora Ewing. Hello and good day from wherever you come from. I'm a sister and an ally of our big country. We are a strong people and will rise in our truth. It's really interesting. Most Aboriginal languages don't have um, the, I think you would call it the ownership syntax. So there isn't an I am because there is no I um, in most Aboriginal cultures around the world, but certainly all, pretty much all that I'm aware of in Australia, there is no I am because that would be um, quite dominant and we don't have that that sort of culture. Um, so we would say something like Abudjuri uh, Gamarewa, Nangaminura, Gamale, Nangala, Kate. So I, I would say instead, hello, welcome, um, I'm on my dream country or I'm in my dreaming place. Um, which is Nangaminura in my dreaming place and my name is Kate. So you always as an Aboriginal person, even in English, when we meet other um, First Nations people, the first thing everybody says is, what's your surname and where do you come from? Because it links us directly to a place, a physical place and its people. So the way that we would always introduce ourselves is where we're from, like where are we right now and what's our name? Of course, um, the Eora Nation is an original nation construct um, of Aboriginal Australia. It is um, in the Sydney Basin area. It's bordered by three rivers, the Hawkesbury to the north, the Nepean to the west and the Georges River to the south. In that basin area were originally 29 major clan groups and we think anywhere between 9 and 11 language nests or bases. Um, the Gadigal language and the Gadigal people are one of those 29 groups. Each of those groups didn't have its own language, but certainly would have had its own dialect, would have had um, those base nest groups that then informed um, the larger groups of language. Uh, for us, we're very lucky in that, well, we're very unfortunate in that our language um, is, was considered completely dormant or sleeping. Um, as some people like to put it, instead of dormant, it sounds like it's dead. Um, and we're very lucky in that we had a professor, an Aboriginal woman, uh, in 1994 um, put together a Sydney language dictionary as part of her PhD. Um, her name is Professor Jackie Troy. She's at Sydney University and she's one of the leading linguists um, for not just Aboriginal languages, but dormant languages of, the fir of First Nations people around the world. Um, I'm very lucky to have met her a few years ago. Um, and as her language dictionary obviously pertains to my clan group, it was very natural for us to begin working together um, to both teach me the language, but also further develop what that looks like, sounds like, and also the language in practice. So grammar, um, how words go together, how children adopt the language. So it's been, um, it's been big. <laughs> it's been a really big journey. Culture is everything. So um, for us as a family group, and for me as an artist and as a mother, um, culture is the predominant driving force um, in everything that we do, whether it's you know the education of our children, um, and this I'm speaking on you know my husband's behalf. He isn't Aboriginal, but you know is by default <laughs> because we have three small children together. Um, and I think that for us, it's very much about ensuring that the children are very confident in their culture, something that I didn't grow up with and something that I didn't, wasn't allowed in a lot of ways to have. So things like language, giving people the, the ability to speak 
in their native language again is such a huge um, step towards reconciliation. It's also such a huge step towards the recognition of a trauma event and it's a big step towards healing. Um, you know, one of the biggest um, colonial rhetorics in Australia was to destroy families by taking children and stealing language. If you take people's babies and then you don't allow them to talk to each other, it becomes pretty hard to exist. Um, that becomes a very um, mentally and physically challenging world to live in. So it's, um, it's not... Um, I don't think it was an accident that we've got to this place at 2023 with quite a divided country of the people that have and the people that have not. Um, there is quite a big divide and in breaching those divides by relearning language, creating pride in relearning culture, um, academically researching and diving into the study of my culture, not just the oral history and the family cultural learning is really important to me. Um, it means that we get more back. We're clawing a little bit more back all the time. And we're also putting things, it's almost like putting things back into a natural state of order. Um, you know, a lot of my practice focuses around um, that cultural natural state of order. Um, it's a document in time. It's a rhetoric on where we're at. But it also is in um, many examples using a lot of our time honoured skills um, and materials like ochres and natural earth pigments and clays and crushing them and milling them and making them. It's, it's slow art. It's a slow process of embedding cultural knowledge into the making of the art. Um, and those things are, you know, that, that gives us the opportunity to learn. It gives us the opportunity to grow, but it also gives us another opportunity to educate. So in being able to tell the stories the way that I do, in the mediums that I tell them, and in the way that I tell them, and I'm able then to speak to them, um, that big gap shrinks person by person. Oh my God, my kids. <laughs> um, I think it's always, you know, it's the past generations and the future generations. It's quite interesting in most Aboriginal cultures, and I'm, I'm sure it's very similar in most First Nations cultures, that, you know, we believe in a very different construct of time. We don't believe in, you know, the Western style of book you know, literacy, and I don't mean being able to read or write, I mean literacy within a world. We don't believe in a start, a middle and an end. We believe in a consistent cycle. So, and to not break that cycle, you know, constant sustainability of practices, of fishing, of farming, of using the land, of working with the land. Um, and by land, I don't just mean physical earth. I mean, all of that. You know, we have a word for that called Nura, and Nura means country, but it's not just the physicality. It's very much a spiritual place, an embodiment of what is on the ground. So, you know, plants, animals, insects, the cycles of those things and how they all work together in a beautiful ecosystem symbolically and symbiotically um, for a, a, a better landscape. Um, yeah, so for me, it's, um, it's, it's big. It sounds really lofty sometimes. It sounds like either you're quite alternative and hippie or that you're making it either too difficult or too simple. But in so many ways, that simplicity is quite complex and the complexity is actually quite simple. And I think teaching that to my children, learning that from my elders, learning that from um, my academic research, learning that from the professors at Sydney Uni that I work with, learning that through every Aboriginal person that I meet and interact with, we all share, we all brush off on each other, whether we like it or not. Um, and then being able to pass that through to my kids is the ultimate sort of cycle. 
I've always been fiddling with things. Um, yeah, I used to have. A, I remember I used to have a card stall at home, um, and on Saturday nights I used to make all my family <laughs> buy cards, gift cards that I'd hand drawn for five cents a card, and that was maybe when I was four or five. Um, so I've always been very entrepreneurially creating um, things, but I think that, that you know th- this version of my artistic expression exploded when I had children. I really needed that outlet. I really felt my culture like land on me like a ton of bricks, um, both the responsibility of it, but also the joy. So the two in perfect tension, this you know, need to do more to feel like I was showing up for my community and for my people and advocating for better treatment. And at the same time, this utter pure joy that I wanted my children not to have to fight for, that they would just be able to have it and they would know no different. They'd just get it. It'd be just like a great freebie for them. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think seven years ago is when it, it truly exploded. I was also extremely um, unwell. I broke my back. So I was um, sedentary without moving for a really long time uh, for like a few years. Um, and I think that gave probably what is a very busy brain, um, the opportunity to slow it down a little bit and receive a lot more joy out of the simplicity of what culture has to offer me, where before that I was probably very fast paced, always busy, kids around, mum, you know, things happening, where when you get laid flat on your back, literally, um, there's not much to do. You all of a sudden have a lot more time to start thinking about, um, you know, the rhetoric of the world, the philosophy of the world and how you want to create a better place. I'm really glad in some ways that I wasn't at home. I think the, um, the isolation of being in Paris was probably really difficult for me personally um, to cope with that decision last week, but it also meant that perhaps I didn't cop as much as I would otherwise have and perhaps I wouldn't have coped that well. Um, I'd like to say that I was ashamed, but I didn't vote no. <laughs> and I, pretty much everyone I know didn't. Um, I think it's shameful. I think it's extremely disappointing. I think that um, these times of conserv- ultra-conservative governments and fear-mongering and very atypical, um, the push and pull of very atypical news media is really shameful. I think that we've built a navel-gazing culture that self-perpetuates quite a lot of fear-mongering and negativity. Um, And unfortunately, a lot of people possibly weren't aware of exactly what they were voting for, I don't think, which is is a shame in itself, um, that we weren't that important um, to have done some more research, to have looked into it. Because I think that, you know, there'd be a good 20 or 30% in my opinion that probably just went, oh, I don't know, I'll just tick no, um, which is really disappointing. Um, the challenge for us will be trying to keep the co-opted 40% of people that did vote, yes, it's 38 to 40% that did vote yes with us, we're 3% of the population, tiny, um, that extra 37% of that population is trying to keep them with us um, on the rest of the journey. You know, we started at 3% at the beginning of that political cycle, and at the end, we ended up with 40. So if we were a political party, we'd be high-fiving ourselves straight out of the gates. We co-opted actually quite a lot of support. I think it's now about galvanising that support and ensuring that if there is a next time or whatever next time looks like, that we're ready and that we don't allow um, this, you know, really aggressive um, politicking and, you know, really soft news coverage of aggressive politicking that's actually quite violent and really passive aggressive to get into the narrative. I think we need to be smarter and play tougher next time. 
Well, you have to. Well, and that's the thing. Like, I've got little kids. You know, I had to, you know, ring. I had to ring up, you know, the kids at like ridiculous o'clock after the the opening, you know, with a few glasses of champagne under my belt and explain to my eight-year-old why his country didn't think he was worth it. And that's how he took it. He put his, you know, headphones on and I was speaking to him and his understanding of it was that he, he basically thought that perhaps we couldn't be Aboriginal anymore that that's what Australia voted on, that he wasn't allowed to say he was Aboriginal anymore. And I was like, whoa, that is a big, untidy, messy, no one gets to tell you who you are, no one, not even me, no one gets to tell you that. Um, and that's not what we voted on, but I also understand, given all the noise and nastiness and meanness that was going on, why he would think that was what the vote was about. I totally get that as an eight-year-old brain, you would go, oh, people were either saying, yes, you could be black, or no, you couldn't. And I think that if you deconstruct why the vote went the way it did, I actually think most people think that. I think that's actually what a lot of people thought they were voting on, um, not just a simple advisory council that was going to provide better resource and understanding for First Nations issues, like things that don't happen to white people, like kidney dialysis that's in every remote community, like the education gap, like the literacy gap, like our health issues, like our incarceration issues. None of those things affect white people. This advisory body wasn't set up to advise on what was happening to white people. It was just for us. Um, and I think that that's a very different mental construct. If you know, I had the chance to say that to every single person that voted no, I think you'd turn half of them because that's not what they thought they were voting on. And like making, making promises, you know, we had you know, the, the opposite political party that was telling everybody to vote no came out and said, we'll have another referendum, we'll call it. If it says no, we'll change the, thing, we'll change the question. And then the next day did a press release saying, oh no, oh, psych, not doing it. So there was just this, you know, entire roller coaster ride of, you know, sort of sideswiping crap from both sides. I just think it, what it did was um, put Aboriginal people in a seat of responsibility again. So I don't know how many times it's our problem to try and sort this out. It's like, you know, we're people. Why is it always up to us to be pushing for better? Surely as human beings, we're all, we all deserve to be treated equally. So it's a bit tricky. I just think the shamefulness of it all, like I've been obviously here and in London and everyone I've spoken to is like, oh my God, I can't believe it. You know, a lot of people are likening it to apartheid. You know, I said to someone in London the other night, I said, you know, I think it'd be really great if the world looks at it like apartheid because South Africa had quite a lot of um, intense um, political backlash from the world because of apartheid. So perhaps, you know, we should get some of that political backlash too as Australians, and maybe the government will start to, to take pause and listen. It's, you know, I, I've, got a, I've got a girlfriend who um, is gay, and she, quite rightly, and Aboriginal, like, she ticks all the boxes. She's like, how many times do other people get to vote on me? First of all, you, everyone got a, a chance to say whether I could get married or not. And now everyone gets to tell me whether or not I can have a voice in the parliament. I was like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. That's actually quite, like, how many traumas do we have to put minorities through to try and force them to be like a majority? Where, you know, it's part of the blessing is that we are a small group and that there aren't many of us and that we've got so much to offer and so much to learn. Um, and we're such a sharing community. You know, we've got one of the biggest art practices for the smallest amount of people in the world. Aboriginal art is understood and celebrated everywhere. For a tiny, tiny little population in a tiny, tiny little country, that's amazing. You know, harness some of that joy instead of the negative rhetoric is sort of my call out.